Hey everybody, welcome to interview number one of my series, Scaling Your Divi Web Design Business. This first talk is with Tim Streifler, a buddy of mine who has essentially two businesses using Divi. He's got his personal brand, his client side of things under timstreifler.com, and then he of course runs and oversees Divi Life, which is home to some of my favorite Divi plugins, including Divi Overlays, Divi Bars, Divi Dashboard Welcome, among others. Tim's awesome. We got into the weeds about how he started his business and how he now runs a very effective growing business from the client side, but then also the product side. And now he's got a small team. He's got a full-time support person helping out with products. And we talk in detail about how he's managed all that, how they centralized communication, how he stayed sane by having a client-based business and a Divi product business. So we really had an incredible talk. I think you're gonna get a lot of value from it. And I gotta warn you, I'm using a new screen recorder for Skype and I had a video setting wrong. It's kind of zoomed in on us. All the other interviews look fine, but this one is just zoomed in, but I didn't want to re-record it. It was such a good talk, and Tim gave me over an hour of his time to do this, so um, bear with us there, but you can always download the audio if you want. So it's just a little zoomed in, but again, a great talk, such good, actionable, and practical advice I know is going to help you out. So check it out, enjoy, and let me know what you think. Tim, thanks for taking some time to chat with us, man. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Josh. Awesome, man. Well, go. Ahead. let's go ahead and talk about kind of where you're at with your businesses. You have timstreifler.com for your um, client side of things, and then you have Divi Life, which has some of my favorite Divi products. And we'll talk about kind of scaling with both of those, but uh, why don't you just kind of tell us where you're at with both of those businesses and what this year is looking like for you this next year? Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, I have the two sides to my business, the, the client services side and then the product side. Um, 2017 was a big year of growth on the product side and I was putting, you know, a huge chunk of my, my focus and, and time and resources into growing Divi life, the, the product side of my business. And, um, that's, that's kind of like the, what I've been working towards is having that type of business where I'm, I'm selling products and I can create something once and sell it over and over again and, and market and, you know, improve ad features and so forth. Well, I absolutely still love creating websites for clients and the, you know, the challenges that each project, um, brings, uh, I still love that. And I, I definitely want to always have some level of client work in my business. Um, so right now I'd say it's probably about like, uh, somewhere between 10 to 20% of, of my time. Um, and so I'd, I'd probably keep it about there, no more than 20, no less than 10, because I always want to be doing client work because that helps me figure out, you know, what products do I want? Um, and then that helps me create products for Divi Life. Uh, I feel like if I'm nice. not doing client work, then I'm disconnected from my audience, which is Divi users. Um, so yeah, it, it's been a, a great year of growth and I'm excited for 2018 and, and seeing, um, you know, how that pans out with more products and, and everything, but, but yeah. Awesome. And I love that you said that, Tim, because I have the exact same mindset mindset to where all of the layouts that I've put out so far have been basically answers to questions that I had, or they probably solve, yeah. uh, they solved the problem that I had with one of my client sites. So I have the same mindset to have, you know, the client things going that way. It keeps it real and it translates into real world problems. So that's really cool. Yeah, definitely. It, so Divi Overlays, that's my most successful product at this point. And, and that came from a, a client website. The client said, hey, it'd be really cool. It was a, a mm. cafe restaurant. It'd be really cool if we could have uh, the menu just open up in a pop-up. So wherever they are on the website, they don't have to wait for another page to load. They just have it right there. I'm like, well, yeah, pop-ups, that's not like totally original by any means, but being able to build it with the Divi Builder and so that, you know, saw the potential for that. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very Definitely. cool, very cool. And so I know we talked before we started the chat, um, but, you know, with your two businesses, do you have any plans to scale the Tim Streifler side, the client side, or are you really kind of gearing towards Divi Life and really scaling that? Yeah, so while I, I kind of look at them as being almost two separate businesses at the same time they're kind of two parts to one business um and i think the benefit of being able to scale the product side is you know in terms of having contractors employees people like that on my team well they can also help me on the client side of things too so it's kind of basically scaling both at the same time or i guess scaling you know the 
the parent company, which is Tim Streifler LLC. And I kind of, that's the umbrella that, that holds divylife.com and Tim Streifler.com. And so as long as they're working for, for me, my LLC, then I can have them help me on the client side or the product side. But, um, again, the product side has definitely been the focus and, you know, that's always the intention of, of bringing people on is to help me there. But, um, it's nice to be able to, to pull people off of, uh, you know, on the product side to help on a client project and so forth. Sure, and so, sure. um, so yeah, it, it's kind of gets the benefit of, of both sides of the coin. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that kind of leads me to my first main question for you, Tim. And that's basically why, why do yeah. you want to scale your business? And before you dive in, I guess I know scaling has kind of a negative connotation to it. Like it feels a little corporate-y and it feels yeah. like, you know, a bunch of guys in suits trying to you know, get their, their profit margins up and up and up and all that stuff. But for yeah. me, I know bef- before you dive in, what I realized was that scaling for me is going to free me up to do what I really want to do. I don't want to handle yeah. email support. I don't want to handle, you know, sites breaking and widgets breaking like that kind of thing is those are the things that really kind of, you know, destroy my creativity. So for me, it's all about freeing up. So for you, why do you want to scale? Yeah, excellent question. Um, so I would say to answer that, take a step back. So in college, um, when I f- started college, I had no idea what I wanted to do, what I wanted to study. I was undeclared for my first two years and just did general ed and absolutely hated it. And then I finally figured out over the, the summer between my second and third year of college that I wanted to do business entrepreneurship and that someday I'd want to work for myself, have my own company. Um, and, and be uh, an entrepreneur. And so kind of since then, I always wanted to start a company. I just, I didn't know what it looked like. I wasn't building websites then, um, had no idea what WordPress was. <laughs> um, but I knew someday I wanted to start a business. I didn't know what it was, what it looked like, uh, you know, what industry, whatever. Um, but then as I kind of discovered WordPress and, and you know, started building websites and everything, I saw the, the benefit of working for myself and being able to um, have that flexibility of working from home, working when I want, my own schedule, uh, working with the clients that I wanted to work with and doing the types of projects and everything. And I think as a freelancer, there's a lot of those freedoms, um, but I still, I felt like I hadn't found, you know, what I really wanted to do long term. Uh, And then I, I kind of, by accident, kind of stumbled into creating products I was using Divi. I wasn't super involved with the the Divi community, but I started getting more involved with the Facebook groups. And um, I had a a, a small little plugin that I had created for a client site. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to put it on one of the Divi marketplaces and just see how it does. Mm. And by no means did it, uh, you know, make enough to to pay the bills, but it, you know, it was a $5 plugin. But I saw the potential of the, the Divi community and, you know, people wanted products for the Divi market. And so I started creating more products and I realized how much I love it, being able to design products and, and you know, really uh, dive into the, the features and the user experience side of things to create things that will, will help other Divi users build their sites. Um, and so, yeah, I felt like once I kind of came across that, I, I found like what I was looking for, uh, you know, in being able to to have a product business. Um, well, don't get me wrong, I, I still love the the service side of things, but as we all know, there's the downsides of uh, being a freelancer um, potentially, un- unless you scale, which is obviously the whole purpose of this this <laughs> talk. Um, if you're not scaling, then you you can only make as much money as the hours you have in the day because right. yep. you know your your time is your money. And so I wanted to kind of get away from that. And focus on something that would allow me to make money, you know, that's completely separate from the time. Obviously, the more time I put in and the more products I develop and the more marketing that I do, um, the more I'm going to be able to grow. But I wanted to, to, I didn't want it to be a, a direct correlation between the hours I put in the day, you know, that I can bill. Um, and so, yeah, that was just naturally a good fit for me. And, and, and obviously, I know a big big part of, of the series you're doing, Josh, is, is being able to scale the service side as well. Um, and I've, I've done that a little bit, kind of, as I mentioned previously, being able to kind of scale them both together. Um, but yeah, the, the product side has always kind of been uh, something I, you know, really ex- excites me. And so scaling, kind of like you mentioned, allows me to be able to focus on the things that I want to focus on. So um, what that has looked like, uh, over the course of this year, it's actually been a little over a year now. I hired, 
um, a full-time support person. I, I started her out doing 10 hours a week and we slowly ramped up. Oh, awesome. um, and I, I actually don't hate doing support by any means, but it is very time consuming. <laughs> uh, it sucks up a lot of time. And so by, uh, scaling in that way and bringing on someone to do support full time, I can step back and look at more of the big picture and focus on the things that I think I'm good at, which is, you know, product development and, and coming up with feature product ideas, feature ideas and uh, marketing and, and so forth. So I guess all that to say the long answer to I, I kind of what you mentioned already, um, scaling for me has been about getting to focus on what, what I want to focus on and what I think I'm good at. And so for you, is that marketing, the product development and, you know, kind of, yeah. kind of being the, the head honcho leading, leading that and then having, you know, inquiries and kind of the smaller stuff be taken care of by somebody else ideally. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, the, the product development, that, that's what really excites me is, is thinking of new product ideas and, um, you know, ways to, to help Divi users create products better or, cr or create websites better using Divi. Um, and then, yeah, the marketing side as well. I, I still do all the pre-sales questions. So uh, support is done by uh, Shafak. She's my employee. She's based in Dubai. Um, she, she's awesome. Anyone who's uh, had experience with my support knows how great she is. Um, and then I'll still do some of the pre-sales questions and, and, and so forth. Um, but, but yeah, because I, I enjoy getting to, to talk about my products. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's talk about support then, Tim. So how did you yeah. find her? Did you find her via a Facebook group or like a, an ad online or something? Or? Yeah, great question. So I met her in uh, the Divi Freelancers for Hire Facebook group. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm actually an admin of that group now. I don't think I was at the time, but... I basically, yeah, just posted an ad in that uh, Divi Freelancers for Hire Facebook group and said, hey, I'm looking for, you know, someone that's an expert in Divi and can help me with support, blah, blah, blah. Got a ton of inquiries. And um, yeah, she just felt like um, Shafak was just the, the right fit. Um, she had experience doing support, uh, working for Studio Press, uh, the company behind mm -hmm. the Genesis framework. And so um, that experience was what really attracted me. And so, yeah, it was it was a, a great find. And um it, it, she, she really enjoys having the stability of, of working for a company and, and doing the support side of things as well. So awesome. Yeah. It was well, a match made in heaven. We don't have to talk about numbers per se, but did you kind of have like a job description that you provided and what you're willing to pay per hour and just make sure somebody meets the criteria or how did that work? The hiring process? Yeah. So I, yeah, in my initial ad, I kind of, um, put in detail what I was looking for in terms of, of skills and requirements. You know, the, the nice thing of, you know, being a remote company and servicing customers that are all over the world is time isn't, you know, the exact hours isn't super necessary. Uh, you know, we, we do have at Divi Life uh, official support hours, which is, you know, your typical nine to five during Monday through Friday. However, you know, she works sometimes during those hours, sometimes outside. And so it, um, it, it varies. And so, um, yeah. So, and then I had an idea of, of what I could afford. Um, and then, yeah, cause I, I, you know, I got people from all over the world, you know, they had different requirements of what they needed to be paid, you know, some were in my budget, some weren't. Um, and so, yeah, what, what she, she offered was kind of what I had in mind already. And so oh, that okay. Was kind of okay. Another, another good sign that it was a, a good fit. Cause I think, I don't know, I'm, you know, some people that are like, you know, business people and, and they want to, I, I worked for a guy like this where he wanted to negotiate everything. It doesn't matter what the price was, no matter what he was going to negotiate. It's kind of mm -hmm. like, you know, no matter what your first offer is, he's going to talk you down. So you might as well start high. It was kind of like that. I'm not big on that. Like, I think if, if someone is saying, Hey, this is what I need to get paid. I'm not going to try to talk them down because then if they agree to it, well, then they might be, um, unhappy and, and right, unsatisfied yeah. and, and even though they agreed to it because they need the steady work but then now they're just they're not enthusiastic about it and it's they're you know they're going to be continuing to look for something making more so are um, you are you of the mindset to where you kind of want to see what they want to get paid and then you either match that or top it to you know encourage them to to want to stay with you and be better is that kind of the mindset you're talking about um yeah, basically. So, um, yeah, I think I, I agreed to what, what she wanted initially. And then I think it was like maybe like a, a, a look slightly higher than what I was had in mind, but pretty close. Okay. And, and then, um, 
you know, I'm big on, you know, good work gets rewarded, you know, with raises and then bonuses and, and stuff like that. Um, but, but yeah, I don't know, just for me trying to talk someone, you know, lower than what the rate they would request. Um, not, a, not a good start to a fruitful yeah, relationship. Yeah. Exactly. When it's going to be like an employee situation <laughs> and, and, you know, working, you know, and, and you want them enthusiastic about the brand and, um, you know, working hard, you want them to feel like they're getting compensated fairly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah. And so you started out with 10 hours a week, right? And then you've scaled. I mean, how, how many hours is she working now? Cause your store is growing. You have yeah. a few more products now. So I think we went from, from 10 hours a week to 20 hours a week and then basically doubled that again to, you know, a full, full time. So, oh, wow. Wow. um, yeah, so she, I don't think it's, you know, consistently exactly 40 hours a week. Um, you know, sometimes it's a little bit more, sometimes it's a little bit lower. Okay. Uh, it just kind of depends week to week how many, you know, tickets we get in. But, um, yeah, no, she does a great job and, and she's, she's passionate and about helping the customers to her. It's not just, you know, punching a time clock. Uh, she wants to, you know, help the customers get the results that they want and, you know, fix any problems that they have, that sort of thing. And to me, that's like right there. That's the kind of person you want on your team. Someone yeah. that, uh, is enthusiastic about the bigger picture and they're not just, you know, like obviously they need the money to, to, you know, make a living and, and pay their bills, but that's not the, the only reason why they're there. Yeah. Now when it comes to like the hours like that, cause I'm kind of thinking about this for myself is do you pay 40 hours a week no matter what? Or does she kind of submit like, Hey Tim, I had 35 this week or this week I had 45. Do you, do you pay it like that? Yeah. So we have a a shared Google doc. And so she logs her hours, um, like weekly. And then, uh, I pay her twice a month based off of that. Um, and and that way when the weeks are are busier and she's, you know, working, you know, a 10 hour day kind of a thing. Cause you know, like for example, uh, during black Friday, cyber Monday, we're kind of just getting past that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, we had an influx of customers, which means we have an influx of support tickets coming through. And so, you know, she worked more than she would normally have a lot more. And so that way, uh, since I'm paying her hourly, that way she can get paid for that, you know, rather than if she went over 40 and I was only paying her. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That makes sense. Well, okay. So that's a good segue to one of the biggest questions I wanted to ask you. And I'm going to ask everyone I talk to in this series is did you wait until you had money to pay her like until you had a bulk of money saved up for that role or were you of the mindset that it's like you know what i need to fill this role in order to make more money you know i need to to profit more to be able to fill this role yeah so uh with her i waited until i i did have the money and i could afford her right then based off of of current sales coming through okay um and so Yeah. I mean, I I could see the value of of kind of both ways, you know, kind of looking at it. Well, if I even though I, you know, can't completely afford this person right now, I can kind of make the jump and that will allow me to, you know, more time to focus on other products and so forth and then, you know, be able to scale faster. Um, So I I definitely see the value in that, too. But but yeah, this particular case, it was an easy decision because I, I, I could afford, um, to, to pay a support person. And so it was just a natural fit that would free me up to be able to, to focus on new products and everything. Okay. Uh, but cool. I'm not, I'm definitely not against the idea of, you know, taking that little bit of risk to hire someone when you're not completely there yet, uh, to help you kind of get past that hump, um, and be able to scale faster. Yeah. And it's a really tough mindset to break because I, I've done a little bit of subcontracting over the past few years and, it's just very easy to say, well, I could do it a lot faster and I could knock this out in a half an hour. But just getting over the mindset and realizing that that half an hour could be better use of my time. Not that there's any demeaning work of support or anything like that. It's all equally important. But, you know, like if you're being doing the big picture stuff and you're creating products, you know, you need to devote the time to that. And I'm kind of trying to apply that as well. Like I could do this work, but if I'm going to scale and grow it all, I've got to delegate better. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and on, on to that point, one thing that I've learned over the past year is, you know, sometimes I tried to think of not, not, not on the support side, but more on like, um, you know, having someone help me with, uh, you know, more on the, the design development side is I tried to, um, justify the cost on that, that one project that they're starting with and, you know, making sure that I can, you know, meet the proper, you know, margins and have it make sense. Well, obviously that's great and that's best case scenario. Sometimes I think it's okay if you 
Maybe you only break even on that first project with them. But if you think they're going to pan out and there's someone that you would want to work with, well, the next one, you're going to be more in sync. Um, they're going to be used to working for you. Uh, they're going to, you know, you're going to be just in tune of, of what, you know, what uh, they'll know what, what you're looking for and so forth. So then each time it gets a little bit better. And so that's that's something that, that, that I've learned um, is I always try to like, you know, find someone, hire someone that like can give me exactly what I want, like right then, which obviously that's best case scenario. It's not always possible, but if I, I, I've learned that it's okay to kind of take that gamble and, you know, over a course of a few projects, have someone kind of be developed into that ideal person. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, and that's a good point. That's probably just a good frame of reference. If you're going to do any sort of subcontracting or hiring out is yeah. that, the first few projects are definitely not going to be as profitable. Just, I mean, put yourself in their shoes. They got to get to know you, the product, the service, you know, there's going to be a lot of things there that are, are going to, you know, take more time. But like you said, as a couple projects go by, you get quicker. It's just like web designers using right. Divi. We get faster and faster, hopefully with each build. And so, yeah, I'd imagine, and particularly for like the product side for you, I would imagine you get the same questions a lot, so she could probably, or the sportbook right. could probably answer things a lot faster, or have, you know, saved email templates, or you could collect your top most popular questions, and you could have like an FAQ section that people could refer back to. I imagine there's a lot of strategies that can help each, you know, month be more profitable or whatever. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Yeah, there's a learning curve on on both sides. So, like on the support side, uh, for uh, Shafak, my employee, to be able to. Yeah, get used to some of those common problems. And then there's the learning curve on my side, knowing how to delegate and, and manage someone. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that's something that's important is, uh, you know, it takes time to kind of get used to that, you know, the art of delegation, mm -hmm. basically. So I, this wasn't on my list of questions, but I'm curious with working with somebody overseas, is there a language barrier there? Are there like custom differences? You know, like, have you had some, not issues, but is it just kind of, tough you know working with somebody who you know might have a completely different lifestyle than you is are there some things you had to get used to and, and things like that yeah so with shafak she actually grew up uh in the states uh she's from pakistan originally grew up in the states moved back to pakistan now she lives in dubai and so um you know she's 100 percent fluent in english um, okay. you know growing up and, and going to school in the states so her writing skills are are you know top notch um and so i i think i i really lucked out with her um other contractors that i've i've uh i work with currently and worked with in the past you definitely have to um you know look look at that you know their their um their english skills and their writing skills um for me i want to be able to even though the majority of the communication is done you know messaging over slack i still want to have the opportunity to talk to someone over the phone and so i'd want them to be fluent in English enough to have a conversation. Um, I think when, when someone is overseas, there's always going to be some level of, of language or communication barriers or cultural barriers. Um, but I, I think to me, that's, it's, it's kind of fun learning about those things. And, um, you know, it's kind of expands my horizons, uh, you know, knowing, you know, different kind of getting to know their cultures and, and Googling, like, for example, over Christmas, I was uh, did some Google searches like, OK, you know, one of my uh, developers uh, is in this country. Like, do they celebrate Christmas? Like, you know, mm -hmm. can I can I, you know, <laughs> say, hey, Merry Christmas? Yeah. Kind of thing. yeah. So uh, to me, that's kind of the, the fun of uh, running an online company and having a team a remote team all over the world is, um, you know, getting to learn, you know, the, the different, you know, um, things that are customary in different countries and, and so forth. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Oh, yeah, definitely. And did you do a call with her initially when you did kind of the hiring process? Or And I guess my second question, my follow-up question would be, do you still talk to her on the phone much, or is it mainly online through Slack and stuff? Yeah, so before I, yeah, I've hired anybody, I've always done a, a call, whether that's over Skype, over um, you know Facebook Messenger or anything. And then now the bulk of my communication with, with anybody on my team, um, which I have some some part time uh, developers, um, the bulk of it is through Slack messaging. That's what I prefer. Um, I'm not a big phone person in general. Um, I would rather you know be able to you know do multiple things at once and, and do Slack communications. But there are times where it's like okay, uh, it's going to be way easier if I just you know jump on a call and, oh, okay. and talk talk things over. And so yeah, that that's why I always make sure they can. Um, 
they can do both. And, and actually that, uh, that reminds me. So Matt Mullenweg, uh, the co-founder of WordPress, the CEO of Automatic, um, something I picked up from, from him, I think he talked about in an interview or, or someone wrote about it in a blog post or something. He actually does all the hiring for Automatic. Mm -hmm. Um, he, he does all the screening and then, uh, after he, he approves someone, then he passes them on to the manager that would actually be hiring them for that specific, specific team. Oh, okay. Uh, and then he, he starts all of his interviews with Slack or, or you know, Skype text-based messaging because um, in his mind, if that's the majority of the type of communication we're doing, then I need to make sure that they can communicate in that way. Wow, and that's a really good point, yeah. Yeah, and and it makes so much sense. And so um, I, I kind of got that from I don't do that that same method, but um, so I do both, you know, text based, you know, talking, and then also, uh, you know, over a, a, some sort of voice voice call as well. Yeah, because you you could potentially, you know, somebody could really falsify their personality over a call or face to face, and then they could get on a support chat and be like, I don't know, Google it. You know, so yeah. I imagine you, you do pick up a lot. And I think you and I have realized that in talking with each other through Facebook Messenger and then just talking with the Divi community, you can tell a lot about a person's character and personality with the way they answer a question or the way they just communicate quickly with a right. message on Facebook or something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so that's been, yeah, important for me. Um, and yeah, because uh, I, I think also to your point with, you know, language and, and cultural barriers, um, I think you can basically you can pick up on that with one of the two, you know, whether through a voice call or, or messaging. Um, and so I think it's kind of important to kind of get those things out of the way before you bring someone onto your team. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, one other question I had was going to be how do you centralize communication? So it sounds like Slack is your primary tool. Do you have a like a Divi Life Slack account that you just add people to, or yeah, definitely. So I have a, a Divi Life Slack account, and um, I won't bring someone on until I feel like they're going to be a long term, you know, member of of the team um, onto the Slack account. Um, so Slack is yeah, primary, and then Asana for like project management. So you know, uh, doing products and stuff, and um, and then. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Do you mix that with your Tim Streifler stuff, or do you segregate, you know, Divi Life products versus client stuff? I I, I keep it separate. So they're yeah, they're a, a separate account, and okay. I can add you know people to both. Um, but that way, it's just yeah, it's you know very evident what pe people are working on, kind nice. of thing. Nice. So what? Okay, let's kind of change pace here, Tim. Yeah. What is or what are some of the struggles that you faced with scaling? I know I think I heard a podcast, the WP podcast that you have with david blackman yeah i think i remember one episode where you guys were talking about some nightmare experiences with you know he's famously talked about somebody he paid you know in a different country and didn't know how much money that was to him and they just took off you know what are some of the struggles and yeah. hardships that you face with scaling yeah um let me think here so i would say the probably the struggle for me is uh, being, you know, a small company and when you start when it's just you and you're kind of the one doing everything, sometimes it's, it's, or at least for me, a lot of the times it's hard for me to let go mm. and trust that, Hey, I've hired good people that they know what they're doing. You know, they're, they're prepared. And so it, me, it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of hard for me to kind of take a step back, let them do their job so I can focus on other things. I tend to kind of want to like micromanage a little bit. Um, and so that's been hard. And then also, um, Finding, I guess, sometimes I, I, you know, like for example, I've been wanting to, to hire a designer and trying to find a designer that also knows Divi and so forth and, and have like this ideal person in my head that I'm trying to find. Um, and then and what I've kind of learned recently is, okay, I, I can't try to find that perfect person rather than find someone that's, you know, really good and really talented and kind of like what I said before, develop them into that, that ideal person I have in my head. So, you know, that's trusting good. someone. And letting them, you know, basically, yeah, develop into, you know, what I would eventually want them to, to be. Or realizing that, hey, I can pivot a little bit. Um, you know, I don't have to have the workflow exactly like this. This person's really good over here. You know, I can adapt the workflow a little bit, bring on someone else over here to do this. So That's yeah. a really good point because 
you know, particularly depending on what the budget is, I imagine as a new company or, you know, a company who's fairly new in the marketplace, you don't have the budget to hire, you know, a super high end designer. Like I can't hire a Tim Streifler. <laughs> we talked about that on Divi chat. Like we, we really can't hire each other at this yeah. point, you know, but if we can hire people who are like, I'm, I'm kind of looking for Josh like three years ago yeah. to be able to take like, okay, you know, Learn, learn quick. Don't be afraid to fail. You know, here's and it's really about empowerment. I think is what we're talking about yeah, is giving absolutely. the people the tools, the freedom to be able to screw up, and then you know, learn from it, and then take the next step and really develop them to, like you said, the the person who might be ideal in your mind, or maybe it's even better. Like maybe they have expertise that you didn't even think of that could really. I mean, that could be a, a huge part to scaling a business. I imagine. Yeah, definitely. And, and yeah, that's definitely a skill that I think comes with experience as you're, you know, hiring more people, managing more people. Uh, another thing is, and, and I think this is something that a lot of people that are are, are managing and have their own companies kind of go through is you want to find someone that is going to be with you like long term, right? And that's like the goal, best case scenario. They're going to work for you. They're going to get better. You're going to obviously increase their pay as, as you know, years go on, but they're going to be with you forever. Um, and it's so sometimes you, you want to try to find that person rather than people that are like, cause like I think sometimes I think, Oh, this person's, they're really ambitious and they're smart. Like they're probably going to want to go do their own thing, you know, in six months. Mm. Um, and obviously like you don't want to like hire someone that is, you know, for sure is going to, you know, ditch you in six months. But I think if you kind of look at it as, Hey, that's okay. If, if someone works for me and you know, I can help them develop their skills and, um, you know, they can move on to do something bigger and better Then that's great. And, and so I think that's a major mind shift type of thing where, you know, kind of look at each person for more than just your employee, look at them as, you know, their career journey. And if you can be okay. a, a, uh, you know, I guess a stepping stone to that next thing then like hey that's okay like you know there's plenty of fish in the sea there's other people that you can bring on but if, i think if you kind of cultivate that type of culture of developing people and um you know letting them get better and better so that they can you know someday move on that's okay because i think what what can happen is in return you create a really good uh culture where people want to stick around because you're empowering them and uh, you're allowing them to you know, you're not putting them in a box, basically. Yeah, and that could be really tricky, I'm sure, because if you get somebody with, I guess, what I would label with like an entrepreneurial mindset to where, you know, they kind of skip around from thing to thing or they just like right. doing new things, that can be really tricky. I've And I've kind of tried to avoid that. I've kind of looked for people who, and again, the limited subcontracting and hiring I've done, I've looked for people who really kind of need to be told what to do, which is good and bad in the same way. It's good in the way that, you know, they're probably going to stick around longer. And it is good to have people like you and me to where we can probably, you know, we're never going to be bored. We're going to do something. We're going to figure out some problem to solve or to do something. But yeah. a lot of people just aren't wired like that. And that's fine. Like yeah. it's good to be wired to where, you know, some people are very content with just having a to-do list, knocking that out and then going in the For next sure. day. And that's, it's a really good balance, I think. So I'd imagine that's probably kind of a double edged a double edged sword, you know, getting yeah. two people who are really entrepreneurial together unless there's somebody to balance that out. Um, you know, Basecamp right. is a company that, that I use for my project management and I highly recommend their book Rework. Have you read that by chance, Tim? I have not read it, but I've heard a lot about it's it. It's yeah. awesome. You would love it. Um, I read that the the first part of 2017 is the first book I read. And one thing I really got from it was it's cool because so many tech companies out there now, they just want to get as big as they can get so they can sell their company. But both of the owners and that basically say like, we don't want to sell this. We don't want to just get real big and sell it. We want this to be our life. Like we just want to work for Basecamp, what we started. And their culture kind of reflects that. And I've really taken a lot from that to where, you know, I, I don't know what the future looks like, but yeah, I'm kind of trying to have that mindset too. Like I just don't want to build up this corporate machine and then sell it yeah. and then leave all, you know, like I, I'm in the business of building relationships and helping people totally. out with Divi community and with my in transit studio stuff. So that's kind of the mindset that I'm trying to have, but that's a really good point about, you know, the entrepreneurial, like you, you want to be able to, to empower them and, and then if they have enough freedom and you know, or, or all of their needs are met, then I imagine, yeah, then why would they go anywhere else? Yeah, definitely. And, and I think a, a good example of that, in the real world is 
the amazing Elegant Themes. Uh, Kenny Singh, he was um, the lead designer of Elegant Themes several years ago, and he, you know, did a big portion of the design of, of Divi and the launch of Divi, and um, worked on I think the the first stage of the Visual Builder, and then uh, he got recruited by Google, and it's Google, the most one of the most valuable companies in the world, and so he got snatched up. Um, clearly, there is no hard feelings uh, from Nick Roach. Uh, they remain friends. They kept in contact. And uh, Kenny realized that uh, coming back to Elegant Themes was a better fit for him. And so now, you know, he's able to take what he learned working for Google. And, you know, he can he's, he's been able to build out a team, a design team. And now he's being able to do bigger and better things. And so I think that's a really good example is like there was no hard feelings like, yeah, like, why wouldn't you go and work for, for Google? Like, that's an amazing opportunity. But uh, Nick welcomed him back, and you know now they're doing even you know more amazing things together. Yeah, and what a good story of how not to burn bridges from Nick's perspective. Yeah. You know, like he could have very easily been really mad and you know brushed him off and never allowed him to come back in at all. But it may have behooved Elegant Themes in the long run because not only did he get good experiences from Google, but he probably saw a lot of the negative experiences that came with it too to help avoid those. Yeah, so that may have been a really you know a blessing in disguise. That's a good thing to think about. For sure, yeah, I, I've learned a lot from from Nick and the the whole Elegant Themes team. Just kind of from you know watching them, observing them from afar. They're yeah, yeah, <laughs> amazing, amazing team of people. It is remarkable. And then from a support perspective, I know talking to Mitch, the operations director, that he's very grateful for all the Facebook groups because think about how many thousands of support tickets they would have daily if this if the Facebook yeah. groups weren't there. So that's <laughs> that's kind of a testament in itself. Like if you create a community, which I'm not saying you need to create a community for every product you have or every company, but that's a good example of like, if you empower people and you create a community, who knows how that can help you in the long run. Totally. Yeah. And then kind of on the flip side too, you yeah create a, a, a community of, of loyal fans of your products. Uh, it happens all the time where, where people will, you know, ask for a product and, or, you know, Hey, how do I do this? How do I build this pop up? Or, or how do I have, you know, a, a promo bar at the top and mm -hmm. and you know my customers are saying oh go use divi overlays you know go check out divi bars um and you know i don't ask them to do that they just do it because you know i focused on creating good products and having you know good support to, to back that up and you know naturally that just happens and it's kind of a, a just a, a side product of you know, working hard and, and doing the right things. Yeah. And I've seen that in the Divi web designers group to where, cause I've promoted Divi overlays. It's usually probably two or three times a week. I really need to get, <laughs> I need to get an affiliate link from you. I know. Uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it, cause it reflects you. If I refer something, I don't want somebody to upload a plugin and be like that freaking plugin that I used that Josh recommended broke my site, you know? Right. Um, for sure. So yeah, you want to refer good things. And I'm just now seeing that with a few layouts that I have currently in the market is like, I've seen a couple shares on them and there's no cooler feeling than to see something that you created kind of make its way around the community. So I imagine for you, it's, you know, 10 times that. <laughs> yeah. I see it a lot with your tutorials. People will ask certain questions and, you know, people are saying, oh yeah, go check out Josh's tutorial here. And it, and then, yeah, on the product side, you know, whatever, or the tutorial side, it's, it's like affirmation, like, Hey, I'm, I'm creating the right types of things because they're the answers to people's problems. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, it's a solution for someone, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, Tim. This has been a great talk, man. We picked up some really good stuff and we talked about your initial hiring talked about a lot of good things with support so you're using google docs for time tracking do you do any other time tracking any um other, any other thing for that? so i do like on the the client side i i use i use fresh books for invoicing and they have a time tracker built in for for tracking hours i really only do that like for myself on the client side i i mainly do kind of project to project when i'm having other you know contractors help me so then it's you know they just tell me how much it's going to cost i don't have them track their time or anything um and then i use i use uh, quickbooks on the product side um for well i, I mean i guess that's my my whole business uses quickbooks for mm -hmm. for accounting purposes and i should really just use quickbooks for invoicing too that way i'm not paying for fresh books but i haven't quite transitioned that gotcha yet. gotcha you know one thing that i'm working on right now i'm going through a business coaching um like program a six-month program 
And one thing they really helped me figure out is to view my time, like almost treat myself as an employee because I've been terrible yeah. at logging hours and I kind of guesstimate like, yeah, the website might take 20 to 30 hours, <laughs> but I'm really trying to nail that down. That way I know, okay, this website should take a subcontractor no more than like 20 hours or something like that, you know, and that's what kind of what I'm working on to better, um, you know, track time because and I know it's all, it's businessy stuff, but if you're going to scale your business at all to free yourself up to do what you want to do, you have to, it's just kind of, kind of comes yeah. to, ter- to territory i'm sure so yeah. that's really good so the time tracking stuff so support um we talked about some good tools so looking forward we're, we're recording this at the tail end of 2017 so where would you like to be a year from now do you have do you think about how big you want your team to be or you just think about the product side and you kind of think the team will you know go around that yeah so i i look at um so i have revenue goals and then i have kind of, I guess you could say product goals, you know, adding products to the lineup sort of thing. And then I, I look at the team as, okay, how, you know, what people do I need to bring on to help me reach those goals, you know, the product goals and the revenue goals. Um, and so, yeah, for a year from now, I, I plan to, um, you know, I'm still kind of in my 2018 planning phase, so I don't have exact numbers in, in terms of products, but um, you know, trying to nail down the exact product lineup, um, you know, based off of last year, because uh, in or I should say this year, uh, it's still 2017 technically. Um, I launched two products in 2017, and you know that that took a lot because you know they're more their plugins are more involved, lots of features and lots of updates after those those launches, and so. I know in 2018, I'd for sure like to double that to, to doing four launches. Awesome. Um, and so I'm, I'm still trying to figure out ex- exactly, but that's probably what I'm leaning towards is, is, is doing four four major products with some smaller products, you know, layouts or child themes in between. So Cool, cool. And so I imagine the number of support people doesn't quite matter. It just, or even your team members, like maybe there's a designer involved later in the year or something. I imagine that'll yeah. do, you kind of just have to see how that all plays out, right? For sure. Yeah. So uh, probably I'm guess I'm going to, you know, based off of just capacity and, you know, how, how much uh, my support can handle currently, most likely a year from now, I'll have another support person. And then I hope to quarter one hire just a, a kick butt designer um, that that can design doesn't I don't even care if they can, you know, touch Divi at all or if they're you know pure PSD okay Um, because that that, I feel like that's where Divi life has been lacking is I've been focusing on the the plugin with the functionality where you know the kind of the design of my own site has kind of suffered a little bit and you know so I need someone that's like you know going to kind of bring me back up to the design quality level I yeah and I thought that was it was interesting at WordCamp because we got to hang out with the guys from Superfly be Superfly their website and they have a designer who doesn't even touch website stuff and I didn't even think I just didn't even think about that, about having a designer who lays it out like that. I mean, obviously, you'd have to talk about what Divi can do and where the liabilities and right. the limitations might be there. But that's yeah, a really good exactly. point. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one more question I had in, in mm-hmm. regards to like scaling the business. So you talked about team. Let me – oh, this is what I was going to say. Let me throw one more um, – yeah. goal in for you if you'd like to take this in because this is what I'm thinking about is you've got your revenue goals you've got your product goals but I would encourage you to think about profit goal, goals too and again profit sounds like such a cheesy corporate yeah. term but what I realized recently was within transit studios I feel like I'm making a ton of money but then at the end of the month I'm like where is all the money <laughs> going from yeah. why is not there more in the account and I realized that I have created one good web designer job. Like I've created a a really good web design job, but I don't have much profit above that. Like my profit margin is about, I think on average, like 10 to 12% for each project. So after you pay yourself, after I pay myself as the web designer, but me as the owner, you really kind of have to step into the shoes of owner. That's not enough to be able to support yourself. And I know some people think, bosses just sit on their butts all day and they'll do anything and just manage people or tell people what to do. But now that I'm like becoming in that position, yeah. anytime I see something on social media, that's blasting bosses and stuff like that. I'm like, you have no idea what they're going through. You have no idea how much oh they learn. Now yeah. I'm like really defensive because I understand, but that that's kind of one goal for me this year is to think about how I can increase profit and maybe yeah. not even, you know, if I'm charging five grand for a certain kind of website, maybe I can still keep it at five grand for my clients, but I can do things I can, um, templatize emails. I can speed up the process. I can really firm up the design process. I can, you know, we've talked several times on Divi Chat about how to, 
you know, manage product projects better and how to speed up things with the client. And yeah, yeah. my goal is for each project to get more profitable, ideally. So that's right. kind of one of my goals this year is what if I can get that up to like 30%? Or something yeah. like that. That way I'm still paying myself as the web designer unless I take somebody on to help me with that. And then there's that extra left over because I have a little one coming this year and I want to be able yeah. to afford insurance. You know, there's a lot of things sure. that, you know, that anyway, I just wanted to, to kind of say that, that that's kind of another goal that not many people talk about. I don't think is, is the totally. Margin. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And you kind of alluded to this, but what's kind of helped me with like the scaling mindset is to kind of take myself out of it and look at the business as a, a living, breathing entity. And then there's kind of like what you said, there's, uh, you know, I have Tim Streifler, the employee that I'm running payroll for, you know, I'm running payroll for myself, the employee. And then I have Tim Streifler, the, the, the owner, right? And so, you know, two separate things completely. And so, yeah, that can really help when you're looking at, you know, revenue versus profit, um, you know, after you pay yourself and everything, so yeah, yeah, no, because that's revenue is point. revenue is great. Like I could say, I want to make a you know a hundred thousand dollars with this web design business. That's revenue. But if you're only taking home thirty, then you know, is it really worth? You know, what what's where is the rest of that money going to? Um, yeah. So yeah, the profit is is a big deal. It's actually funny. I just read a book that I would highly recommend called The E Myth Revisited. It's about the entrepreneurial myth. Oh, okay. And um, the author has helped out hundreds, thousands of companies worldwide, but it's all about scaling. It's all about systematizing, and systematizing is all about freeing you up to do what you want to do, to do what you're best at. But one thing that they laid out in the book that I'm going to do at the start of this year is you basically make an org chart, an organization chart of your business, and you write all you write out all the roles. So for me, it would be like Josh, the CEO, vision, vision guy, you know, big picture stuff. Um, there would be the project manager, there'd be the web designer, the graphic designer, the support person, and you write out all these roles and you put a picture of yourself on each role and you write yeah. their job descriptions and your goal is to try to get yourself off one of those. So for you, yeah. you have a support person on Divi Light, you know, you put her picture there. And so I'm going to do that for in transit studios, but then joshhall.co as well and kind of treat them as two separate businesses. And then yeah. that's my goal as I go along is to kind of take myself out of each one of those roles because right now. It's just nonstop. I'm wearing, you know, <laughs> 10 hats a day, um, yeah. which is cool in some ways. But there are just things now like I was editing a flyer a couple of weeks ago and I'm like, I don't want to be doing I should not be editing this flyer. You know, yeah. th there's I need to be hiring this out. So, um, yeah, that's something to and, think about, too. In addition to like all the responsibilities and how time consuming wearing all those hats is. There really is for certain tasks, especially like it's hard to shift gears and go from designing a website to then, you know, doing something that's more, you know, analytical, you know, like accounting or, or something like that. And so when you're wearing all these different hats, like if, for example, if I'm in like design mode and I've been like, you know, designing a website and so it's a lot easier for me to continue doing that yeah. than it is for me to like shift gears and start doing something completely different with, you know, the other side of my brain. And so there's that like, you know, just the, the act of shifting, I think kind of slows down and can, you know, break your productivity. And that's why a lot of productivity experts, you know, they always say like, you know, do like, you know, one type of work one day and then the next day do, you know, the next type of work. So all day you're kind of staying in that, that mindset. Yeah. And I, I've talked several times about kind of setting up a daily routine, which I try yeah. to stick to, to where I leave a segment at the end of the day for support and things like that. But regardless it's still i would like to get to the point to where i don't have to do that like what if i could take two days and not check my email for support stuff you know yeah. what if i could have which is kind of nice like today we're right after christmas this week's kind of a soft week i would say like i'm doing some client stuff but mostly working on the series and doing stuff that i really enjoy which is this kind of work and yeah. yeah it's awesome i feel more free and i feel more creative and that's kind of my goal is to be able to just you know, limit that to where I don't need to have that reactionary work time where I can have a dedicated day or two to do what I want to do, which I think would pay off big time in the long run. So it sounds like kind of what you're talking about, you know, with scaling. Yeah, yeah you know? absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, Tim, man. This has been great. This has been a really good chat. I think we covered yeah. pretty much all the main questions. I hope it was beneficial for you too. And Oh yeah, um, I'm excited to listen back through this. Like I said, I'm going to be talking with quite a few others in the community, and we're going to. This is going to be on the. By the time this comes out, it'll be on the Elegant Themes blog more than likely, 
And then uh, we're just going to try to help the community and, and build the best thing we can. So is there any final thoughts you want to say as far as scaling to, to folks who are either running a web design business full-time or part-time or getting into the product realm? Any last uh, words of wisdom? Yeah. Let me think here. I'm trying to think of something I haven't final said th- already. Final thought is what we call it on Divi Chat. Fi- yeah. Final thought. Final scaling thought. <laughs> final scaling thought. Yeah. So I, I guess my my question or my last statement would be, um, go for it. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, it's okay to take a, take a risk a little bit, whether you can you know perfectly afford it or not. Um, but I, I think if if you know building a business. And, and scaling a business is something you want to do. Um, you can definitely do it sooner than you think, and so that would I, I think would be my my final thought. Uh, because I, I think I've heard this from other people, but w- you know, once you you finally do, and when, when I finally did and started bringing people on, it was it was like, why didn't I do this sooner? You know, <laughs> why didn't I do this? You know, six months ago, a year ago, you know, whatever. So, um, you know, you don't always have to wait until you, you think you're ready, you know, do it before that point. Because usually when you, you think you're ready, you're, you're already past that. Yep. That's a great call, man. Really good advice. Well, thanks, Tim, for taking the time to talk today. Really appreciate your insight. And uh, I'll make sure to link to some of the tools and stuff we talked about in the show notes for this episode. And really appreciate it, man. We'll talk to you yeah. soon. You are welcome. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate All right. it. Thanks, Tim. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>